Few unsubstantiated ideas have done as much social damage, sometimes tearing whole societies apart, as the assumption that there is something strange, if not sinister, when racial, ethnic, or other groups are not evenly or randomly distributed in particular endeavors, institutions, occupations, or income levels. However plausible that assumption might seem when thinking in terms of abstract people in an abstract world, when it comes to real people in the real world, that assumption is not merely unsubstantiated, but in defiance of mountains of evidence to the contrary in countries around the world and going back for centuries. Geography alone is enough to make peoples different, though geography is just one of many influences that differ from one place to another, and therefore from one people to another. The geography of the Mediterranean world is quite different from the geography of Southeast Asia, not only in terms of such obvious things as soil and minerals, but also in terms of rivers, mountains, climates, disease environments, and other factors whose influences expand or limit the possibilities of different peoples in different ways. The sense of a dependable abundance, fish in the water, rice on the land, as a Thai saying has it, could hardly have been common in the Mediterranean world, where the barren hills, scanty rainfall, and thin soils made survival a struggle and made the peoples of the region renowned for their frugality. Moreover, geography cannot be thought of in two dimensions, as if we were looking down at a map or globe. While a whole region may be dominated by a particular culture, as the Middle East and North Africa have been by the Islamic culture, Peoples living in mountainous parts of the same region, in Armenia or Abyssinia, for example, may preserve a very different religion and culture from that in the lower elevations. Even when Islam became the religion of the Rif Mountains in Morocco, this happened centuries after Moroccans in the lowlands had become Muslims. Similarly, the English language prevailed in the Scottish lowlands, while Gaelic continued to survive in the highlands for generations just as the Vlach language survived in the Pindus Mountains of Greece long after Greek prevailed in the lower elevations. Mountains and uplands have in fact isolated peoples culturally and economically, from the Scottish Highlands to the Highlands of Colonial Ceylon, which in both cases maintained their independence for many years after their respective lowlands were conquered and incorporated into another cultural universe. Even mountainous regions nominally under the control of a larger nation or empire have not always and in all places been effectively under such control. The mountains of Montenegro under the Ottoman Empire, the Rif Mountains under Moroccan sultans, and the uplands of India under the Mughal rulers, for example. Isolation has been a key factor in both political autonomy and cultural separatism, as it has been in the enduring poverty of many mountain regions. In the Apennines Mountains of southern Italy, 91 out of 123 Lucanian villages had no roads whatsoever in 1860. In parts of the Pindus Mountains of Greece, even in the 20th century, there were places more accessible to mules and to people on foot than to wheeled vehicles, and one village acquired electricity as late as 1956. In the Rif Mountains of Morocco, Snow continued to cut off some communities completely in wintertime, even in the late 20th century. The cultural isolation of mountainous communities has been partially relieved by the temporary migrations of its men to lower elevations in search of work, returning with at least a glimpse of another way of life, though the women who remained behind lacked even this. Moreover, few people from other places have come to live in these mountain villages, to present a different viewpoint. Often the great majority of marriages have involved women and men not only from the same mountains, but from the same village. Finally, the poverty of many mountain peoples has often led them to utilize their children's labor from an early age, even at the expense of their education, thereby cutting off yet another source of a broader exposure to the outside world. Another pattern found among mountain people in various parts of the world, at least in recent centuries, has been the production of a wide variety of home-based arts and crafts during the long winter months when time is available. Swiss wood carvings, for example, have had their counterparts halfway around the world in Kashmir, as well as closer to home in Norway, 
Numerous other products of home-based crafts, from weaving to metalwork, have issued from mountain communities and have been sold in the international markets as items of large value in a small physical size, able to bear the high transportation costs from mountain regions. The toughness required to survive in many barren and backward mountain regions has produced renowned fighting men in many parts of the world, from the Highland Scots to the Gurkhas of India, the Albanians, the Moroccan Riffians, the Montagnards of Vietnam, and the Turks, all formidable not only in their own homelands, but also in the service of foreign countries. The elite Scottish Highland regiments and Gurkha units of the British military forces had as counterparts the Albanians and Riffians who fought in the Ottoman armies, as well as the 50,000 to 60,000 Riffians who fought on the side of Franco during the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. It has been estimated that somewhere in the vicinity of a million Swiss soldiers were killed in other people's wars between the 15th and the 18th centuries. The fighting qualities of mountain men have also taken the form of local brigandage and blood feuds in their homelands. Marauders from the highlands have preyed on more prosperous communities in the lowlands for centuries, whether Kurds raiding Armenian villages, Scottish Highlanders raiding Scottish Lowlanders, or similar activity in Italy, Spain, the Balkans, India, and Tibet. Feuds have also been outlets for the fighting ability of mountain men. The celebrated Hatfield and McCoy feud of the American Appalachian region was not only an example of a custom that went back to the parts of Britain from which so many Southerners came, it had its counterparts in similar tribal or clan feuds in the Rif Mountains of Morocco, in the Balkan Mountains of Montenegro, in the Mountains of the Caucasus, and in the Mountains of Taiwan. The minerals found in some mountains present opportunities for mining and for the development of skills connected with mining. Thus, the Germans in the Hartz Mountains became renowned as miners, leading to a demand for Germans to work in the mines of other countries, whether in Bohemia, Norway, Spain, the Balkans, or Mexico. However, the very fact that Germans were imported into all these countries suggests that geography presents opportunities which people are not predestined to grasp, for otherwise all the mountains and other sources of mineral deposits in all these other countries would have led to the development of indigenous miners, obviating the necessity to import Germans. In geographical terms, mountains and highlands in general are important not only as obstacles in themselves, but also as features with both positive and negative effects on other parts of the environment. Rivers and streams flow more steadily because of the snows melting on the mountainsides, whereas their volume of water varies much more widely and more erratically when there are no mountain ranges, as in tropical Africa, where rainfall alone must sustain these waterways, or fail to sustain them. The Sierra Nevada in Spain and the Taurus Mountains in Turkey both supply the water that makes a flourishing irrigated agriculture possible on the plains below, where rainfall alone would not be sufficient. In another sense, however, uplands have a negative effect on rivers, which must plunge more sharply downward, often with rapids and waterfalls, when the streams originate at higher elevations, whether on plateaus, mountains, or foothills. Rivers with steep gradients tend to be less navigable, or not navigable at all. Mountain ranges also drastically affect rainfall patterns. When moisture-laden air blows across a mountain range, it is not uncommon for the rainfall on the side where the moisture originates to be several times as great as in the rain shadow on the other side of the mountain, where the air goes after it has lost most of its moisture while rising over the crest. The net result is that people located on different sides of a range of mountains or foothills may have very different agricultural opportunities. On some western slopes of southern Italy's Apennines Mountains, for example, the annual rainfall reaches 2,000 millimeters, while parts of the eastern slopes get as little as 300 to 500 millimeters. Similarly, in the American Pacific Northwest, precipitation on parts of the west side of the Cascade Mountains averages up to 10 times as much as on parts of the Columbia Plateau to the east. Different sides of a mountain range often have not only different amounts of rainfall, 
but also different slopes. This has had important military implications, where the people on one side have found it easier to climb the gentler slope and then descend upon the other side to invade their neighbors. The locations and shapes of mountain passes have also had other military and consequently cultural impacts. The greater ease of Roman soldiers' entry through the mountain passes into Gaul, as compared to the more difficult mountain route into German regions, meant that Roman culture reached Gaul first, and only later filtered second-hand into the lands inhabited by Germans. Coastal peoples have also tended to be culturally distinctive. In touch with more of the outside world, they have usually been more knowledgeable and more technologically and socially advanced than interior peoples. As with other geographically related social patterns, these are not racial, but locational. Sometimes the coastal peoples are racially or ethnically different, Germans being particularly represented on the coastal fringes of Russia at one time, for example, but the differences between the interior and the coastal peoples remain, even when they are both of the same racial stock. Thus, in the Middle Ages, the largely Slavic population of the Adriatic port city of Dubrovnik was culturally far more advanced in literature, architecture, and painting, as well as in modern business methods, than the Slavs of the interior hinterlands. In tropical Africa, likewise, the coastal peoples more in touch with outside influences were sufficiently more advanced technologically and organizationally to become enslavers of Africans farther inland. One symptom of the importance of coastal areas as cultural crossroads is that many of the lingua francas of the world have originated in such settings, whether in the Levant, on the Swahili coast of Africa, or in the ports of China and Southeast Asia. Land, Climate, and Waterways Soil, of course, has profound effects on the kind of agriculture that is possible and therefore on the kinds of societies that are possible. A pattern of farms that are passed down through the same family for generations is possible in fertile regions, but not in places where the soil is exhausted in a few years and has to be abandoned and a new site found while the first land recovers its fertility. Whole societies may have to be mobile when the land in any given location cannot permanently sustain them. This means that there cannot be cities and all the cultural developments facilitated by cities. Mobile, slash-and-burn agriculture has been common in those parts of tropical Africa and Asia where great cities failed to develop and where the indigenous people long remained vulnerable to conquest or enslavement by people from more urbanized societies and larger nation-states elsewhere. In early medieval Europe as well, Slavs in East Central Europe practiced slash-and-burn agriculture, which necessitated very different forms of social organization from those which emerged after the use of the plow enabled them to create sedentary societies. Moreover, just as the nature of agriculture has influenced where urban life is or is not feasible, so the economic and technological advances associated with cities influence agriculture. Thus, in the 16th century, the hinterlands of such flourishing cities as Venice, Milan, and Genoa saw great improvements in agricultural methods introduced. Deserts and steppes, such as those of North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia, have often produced societies on the move. These nomads have included some of the great conquerors of all time. Wave after wave of conquerors from Central Asia and the Caucasus have pushed other peoples before them into Eastern and Southern Europe over the centuries, creating a chain reaction series of conquests in the Ukrainian, Polish, and Hungarian plains and in the Balkans, as those displaced moved on to displace others. Less dramatic and less extreme have been the seasonal movements in places where sheep, goats, and other animals are herded in different places at different times of the year, rather than exhaust the vegetation in one place. Here, there may be permanent dwellings where the women and children stay while the men migrate seasonally with their herds, as in the Balkans, for example. The Significance of Particular Geographic Features Mountains, rivers, climate, soil, etc. is even greater when these features are viewed in combination. For example, 
The effect of rainfall on agriculture depends not only on how much rainfall there is, but also on the ability of the soil to hold it. Thus, a modest amount of rainfall may be sufficient for a flourishing agriculture on the absorbent lowest soils of northern China, while rain falling on the limestone soils of the Balkans may disappear rapidly underground. Similarly, the economic value of navigable waterways depends on the lands adjacent to them. Navigable rivers which go through land without the resources for either industry or agriculture, the Amazon for example, are of little economic value, even though navigable waterways in general have been crucial to the economic and cultural development of other regions more fully endowed with other resources. In Russia as well, waterways isolated from the major natural resources of the country, as well as from each other, cannot match the economic role of rivers which flow into one another and into the sea after passing through agriculturally or industrially productive regions. Conversely, harbors that are not as deep, not as wide, nor as well sheltered as other harbors may nevertheless become busy ports if they represent the only outlets for productive regions in the vicinity, as was the case of Genoa in northwestern Italy or Mombasa in East Africa. Similarly, the port of Dubrovnik on the Dalmatian coast, strategically located for the international trade routes of the Middle Ages, flourished despite a harbor that was not particularly impressive in itself. Sometimes a variety of favorable geographical features exist in combination within a given region, as in northwestern Europe, and sometimes virtually all are lacking, as in parts of tropical Africa, while still other parts of the world have some of these favorable features but not others. The consequences include not only variations in economic well-being, but, more fundamentally, variations in the skills and experience, the human capital, of the people themselves. Given the enormous range of combinations of geographical features, the peoples from different regions of the earth have had highly disparate opportunities to develop particular skills and work experience. International migrations then put these people with disparate skills, aptitudes, and outlooks in proximity to one another and in competition with one another in other lands. While geographical influences may distinguish one cultural universe from another, even another located nearby, the existence of similar geographical influences and similar social patterns in distant regions of the world marauding and feuds among mountain men, for example, means that such patterns are not national character or racial traits, but are international in scope and geographical in origin. Nor are these patterns necessarily racial characteristics, even in the limited sense of characteristics differing from one race to another for non-genetic reasons. Particular cultural universes may be largely coextensive with particular races, the Japanese culture, for example, but this is not always or inherently so. In short, geographical influences cut across national borders and racial lines, producing similar effects in different countries and different effects in various regions of the same country or among culturally different members of the same race. This is not to say that there are no national cultural influences. Clearly there are. Language, religion, and political traditions are just some of the cultural values holding together nations composed of peoples subjected to disparate other influences. The point here is simply that a recognition of distinct cultural patterns, whether originating in geography, history, or otherwise, is not the same as a belief in national character or racial traits. These things may overlap or even be congruent in some cases, but they may also be quite separate. While continents and other regions of the world may not be geographically unique nor homogeneous within themselves, nevertheless the ensemble of geographical influences operating in one region of the world has differed significantly from the geographical and other influences operating elsewhere. These differences are not confined to their original locations, but are also embedded in the cultures of peoples migrating from these different regions of the world. One of the more geographically fortunate parts of the world, in terms of having the natural resources needed for the development of a modern industrial economy, has been northern and western Europe. Iron ore and coal deposits, 
the key ingredients of steel manufacturing and the heavy industry dependent on it, are concentrated in the Ruhr Valley, in Wales, in Sweden, and in the regions so bitterly fought over by France and Germany, Alsace-Lorraine. The broad coastal plains of northern Europe have also provided the peoples of that region with much prime agricultural land and with navigable rivers crisscrossing these lands, knitting large areas together economically and culturally. The fact that Europe has many peninsulas, islands, and numerous harbors gives the continent excellent access to the sea. The Gulf Stream warms Western Europe to give it milder winters than places at similar latitudes in the Western Hemisphere or in Asia. London, for example, is farther north than any place in the 48 contiguous United States, yet it has milder winters than New York City, much less cities in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Eastern, Central, and Mediterranean Europe do not share all these advantages. The Gulf Stream's influence on the climate of European nations on the Atlantic becomes progressively less in the more distant central and eastern portions of the continent, where rivers are frozen for more days of the year and where winters are longer and more bitterly cold. The natural resources required for modern industry are also less abundant and in many cases virtually non-existent in central and eastern Europe. The broad coastal plains of northern Europe have no counterparts in the Balkans, where hills and mountains come down close to the sea, and the coastal harbors often have no navigable rivers to link them to the hinterlands. Spain has likewise been lacking in navigable rivers, and Sicily lacking in both rivers and rainfall. These sharp differences in geographical advantages have been reflected not only in great disparities in wealth among the different regions of Europe, but also in similarly large differences in skills, industrial experience, and whole ways of life among the peoples of these regions. Thus, when the peoples of the Mediterranean migrated to the United States or to Australia, for example, they did not bring with them the industrial skills or the whole modern way of life found among German or English immigrants. What they did bring with them was a frugality born of centuries of struggle for survival in the less productive lands and waters of the Mediterranean, and a power of endurance and persistence born of the same circumstances. The ability of the Italian immigrants to endure poor and cramped living conditions, and to save out of very low wages, which caused comment among those around them, whether in other European countries or in the Western Hemisphere or Australia, had both geographical and historical roots. Similar characteristics have marked various other Mediterranean peoples, but the Italians are a particularly interesting group to study because they include not only the Mediterranean people of the south, but also people from the industrial world of the Po River Valley in the north, whose geographical, economic, and cultural characteristics are much more similar to those found among northern and western Europeans. The enduring consequences of the different skills and experiences possessed by people from different parts of Europe can be seen in the fact that the average income of immigrants from southern and eastern Europe to the United States in the early 20th century was equal to what was earned by the bottom 15% among immigrants from England, Scotland, Holland, or Norway. Illiteracy was higher among immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. In school, their children tended to lag behind the children of either native-born Americans or the children of immigrants from northern and western Europe, and their IQ scores were often very similar to those of American blacks, and were sometimes lower. Nor was all this peculiar to American society. In pre-World War II Australia, immigrants from southern Italy, Dalmatia, Macedonia, and the Greek countryside were typically illiterate and spoke primarily their local dialects rather than the official languages of their respective home countries. More than three-quarters of these southern European immigrants to Australia were from the rugged hills or mountains, the steep coastlines or islands of the region, rather than from the urban areas or plains. Although these remote areas were eventually drawn into the modern world, the skills of their peoples continued to lag behind the skills of peoples in other parts of Europe that were more industrially advanced, and this was reflected in their earnings in Australia as in the United States. As late as the 1970s, the median earnings of immigrants to Australia from Greece, Italy, or Yugoslavia 
fell below the earnings of immigrants from West Germany or from English-speaking countries. Southern Europeans in Australia remained underrepresented in professional and technical occupations, and from nearly half among the Italian immigrants to an absolute majority among the Greek and Yugoslavian immigrants were unskilled laborers. Asia has likewise had sharp cultural divisions, many growing out of its geography. The world's highest mountain range, the Himalayas, separated Asia's two great ancient civilizations, those of China and India, which developed independently of one another to a greater extent than any of the civilizations of Europe or the Middle East. China in particular was a world of its own and clearly the most advanced nation on earth for many centuries. One sign of its preeminence was that Chinese goods were for long in great demand in Europe, while Europe had nothing to offer in return except gold and silver. The compass was in use in China's maritime trade decades before it was introduced to Europeans by the Arabs, and books were printed in China centuries before the Gutenberg Bible was printed in Europe. Chinese silks and porcelain were in demand in Asia, Europe, and Africa. While Chinese culture had a major impact on the cultures of Korea and Japan, and an influence felt as far away as Persia and Russia, there were few external cultural influences on China itself from the 8th through the 13th centuries. Yet very little of China's culture was spread by migration, certainly nothing to compare with the later massive spread of European culture to the Western Hemisphere, not only by the movement of millions of Europeans, but also by the Europeanization of both the indigenous populations of the Western Hemisphere and the millions of descendants of Africans brought to the New World. The Japanese are a reminder that a meager natural resource base alone is not enough to prevent industrial development, though it may prevent such development from arising spontaneously from within the given society. Japan's industrialization was transplanted from Western Europe, notably England and Scotland, and from the United States, as a result of deliberate decisions made by the Japanese government amid a national fervor to catch up with the West. Why this happened in Japan, but not in India, Abyssinia, or the Balkans, is a profound question with few answers or even systematic explorations. Many centuries earlier, Japan was likewise very receptive to cultural and technological imports from China, which at that point represented the most advanced culture in the world. In short, geography is a major influence, but not a predestination. Otherwise, nations like Japan and Switzerland would be among the poorer nations of the world instead of among the most prosperous. Even after large numbers of Chinese, Japanese, and Indians migrated to other countries around the world, the cultures they took with them had little or no effect on others outside their own respective groups. To a greater or lesser extent, these migrants from Asia tended to assimilate at least the outward veneer of the Western societies in which they settled, though retaining their own work patterns and discipline, which enabled them to rise to prosperity in these countries. The southwestern part of Asia, known as the Middle East, has also sent abroad migrants whose cultural endowments reflect the geographical circumstances in which their societies evolved. Lacking both the spontaneous abundance of food found in parts of the tropics and the natural resources for modern industry found in northern Europe, the peoples of the Middle East have historically had to struggle to make a living, whether in the nomadic pattern of the Bedouins of the desert or in the irrigated farming of others, or, perhaps most striking of all, in the middleman traders who originated in this region and spread throughout the world. The economically strategic location of the Middle East, for centuries a crossroads of trade between Europe and Asia, fostered the development of many trading ports and many trading peoples, of whom the Jews, the Armenians, and the Lebanese have been particularly prominent, not only in the Middle East itself, but also in other countries on every inhabited continent. These kinds of immigrants, middleman minorities, from this part of the world, have had patterns of skills and aptitudes strikingly similar to those of the overseas Chinese who originated in similarly demanding regions of southern China, where trade was part of their survival skills in a geographically unpromising region for industry, but which had trading ports 
The Geography of Africa In understanding black Africa, geography is more important than history. Fernand Brodel In a strictly geographical sense, all the peoples on the continent of Africa are Africans, from the whites of South Africa to the Arabs of the Mediterranean states, but the term has in practice come to refer primarily to the indigenous peoples of Africa below the Sahara, to black Africans. The basis for this focus is not simply racial, but historic, cultural, and geographic as well. As with the British, the Slavs, and others, the influence of geography in Africa has not been simply in its effects primarily on things, natural resources or economic prosperity, for example, but on people. More specifically, the effect of geography in making cultural interactions more difficult has been particularly striking, as between the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa and the outside world, as well as among themselves. To their north is a desert more vast than the continental United States, and to the east, west, and south are the Indian, Atlantic, and Antarctic Oceans. Moreover, the smooth coastline of sub-Saharan Africa has offered few harbors which ocean-going ships could enter, and in many places the shallow coastal waterways have meant that large ships could not get near the shores. Ironically, for centuries, much of the world's international trade was carried in ships that sailed past West Africa on their way between Europe and Asia around the southern tip of the continent. Seldom did they stop. Partly this was a result of wind and ocean currents that made return trips between Europe and sub-Saharan Africa difficult or not economically feasible in the era of wind-driven ships, at least until far greater knowledge of those currents and of alternative routes developed. Relatively little of Africa's trade entered international commerce. In the era before the modern transportation revolution of railroads, automobiles, and planes, which is to say, throughout most of human history, the geographical barriers surrounding tropical Africa have been formidable, though not absolutely impenetrable. The consequences have been not only economic, but cultural. As the eminent French historian Fernand Brodel put it, external influence filtered only very slowly, drop by drop, into the vast African continent south of the Sahara. The geographic barriers to economic and cultural exchanges within various regions of sub-Saharan Africa have been formidable as well. The most striking of these barriers has been a dearth of navigable rivers or streams, though the land itself also presents difficult terrain in many places in the form of escarpments and rift valleys. The net effect has been that the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa have historically been insulated not only from the peoples and cultures of the outside world, but also from one another. Among the cultural consequences has been a linguistic fragmentation of tropical Africa, which has made African languages one-third of all the languages in the world, even though African peoples are only about 10% of the world's population. This linguistic fragmentation has been only one aspect of cultural fragmentation in general, including tribalism and many religious differences. In much of sub-Saharan Africa, a combination of geographic features has had unfavorable, if not devastating, consequences for economic and cultural development, and tragic consequences for the vulnerability of black Africans to outside conquerors. The Natural Environment one of the remarkable facts about the African continent is that, despite being much larger than the continent of Europe, its coastline is shorter than the European coastline, indeed, shorter than the coastline of any other continent, even though Africa is second only to Asia in size. This anomaly reflects Africa's lack of the numerous coastal indentations which form natural harbors in Europe, providing places where ships can dock sheltered from the rough waters of the open seas, thereby enabling European countries to become maritime nations early in their history. In addition to a dearth of harbors, parts of sub-Saharan Africa have shallow coastal waters, so that maritime trade has often had to be conducted by the costly method of having ships anchor offshore, with their cargoes being unloaded onto smaller vessels, which could then make their way to land through these shallow waters.
Africans have generally not been seafaring peoples, except in the Mediterranean or in parts of East Africa where these geographic constraints have not been as severe. Much of Africa, and especially sub-Saharan Africa, has developed without the benefits of a large maritime trade and the consequent stimulus of economic and cultural interchanges on a large scale with various and disparate peoples. While there has been for centuries some trade between sub-Saharan Africa and Europe, or with the peoples of North Africa and the Middle East, international trade has generally played a relatively smaller part in the total trade of Africa, as compared to other continents, not only because of a dearth of harbors, but also because of a dearth of navigable rivers reaching into the interior of the continent from the sea. River mouths opening into the sea have been blocked by sandbars in some places, and in other places the few good harbors have been connected to hinterlands that were not very productive, and so have had little to offer in trade. Thin coastal plains, averaging only twenty miles in width and often backed by steep escarpments, have likewise provided little basis for large-scale international trade, even where other conditions might permit it. Low and irregular rainfall over many parts of Africa fill rivers and streams to a navigable depth only intermittently, and even when filled, many rivers and streams are navigable only by smaller boats or barges, not ocean-going vessels. Where the volume of water is sufficient for navigation by sizable vessels, the many rapids and waterfalls of Africa still impede international trade. The Zaire River, for example, is 2,900 miles long and has a volume of water second only to that of the Amazon, but its rapids and waterfalls near the sea prevent ocean-going ships from reaching inland. Thus, the role played by other great rivers of the world in facilitating the development of ports that became great cities contributing to the economic and cultural development of the surrounding lands and peoples, was denied the Zaire by the intractable facts of geography. Nor is the Zaire unique among Africa's rivers. No river in sub-Saharan Africa reaches from the open sea to deep into the interior. On the Mediterranean coast, only the Nile reaches far inland. Significantly, the Nile spawned the most famous of the civilizations developed on the African continent as well as the two largest cities on the continent, Cairo and Alexandria. Except for the Nile, Africa's rivers that are even seasonally navigable tend to be concentrated in equatorial West Africa, which has produced larger and more advanced societies than in many other tropical regions of the continent. In short, the peoples of Africa, like the peoples of Europe and Asia, tended to develop urban centers and larger cultural universes around navigable waterways. There have simply been far fewer of them in Africa, which has been and remains the world's least urbanized continent. Among the relatively few things which have had sufficiently concentrated value in a relatively small physical size so as to be able to repay the high costs of transport from Africa have historically been gold, ivory, and slaves. All three became major exports, the coast of what is now Nigeria became known as the Slave Coast, just as the coast of neighboring Ghana to the west was called the Gold Coast, and that west of Ghana was, and still is, called the Ivory Coast. One indicator of differences in access to waterways is that, while more than a third of Europe's landmass consists of islands and peninsulas, only 2% of Africa's landmass consists of islands and peninsulas. Such disparities in access to waterways are accentuated when the navigability of these waterways is also taken into account. Even the Niger River, the heart of a great river system in West Africa, draining an area nearly twice the size of Texas, is not navigable everywhere by large vessels, and is not navigable at all in some places because of rapids. At the height of the rainy season, the Niger may become a twenty-mile-wide moving lake, but, during the dry season, the average depth of the Niger can in places fall below four meters. Despite its serious limitations, the Niger compares favorably with other African rivers with even more serious limitations. The Niger has been characterized as the easiest to navigate in all of tropical Africa. Navigating the Niger's chief tributary, the Bainway River, for example, has been more problematical 
Because of seasonal rainfall patterns, the upper Bainway has been navigable only two months of the year, leading to hectic and complicated shipping patterns. If they let the craft stay up the Bainway a day too long, the vessels will be stuck on sandbars for ten months. Yet if through caution or misinformation they withdraw the fleet too soon, much valuable merchandise is left behind and can only be evacuated by land at much greater cost. The first boats to go in are the commercial canoes, then follow the larger craft, and finally, when there is sufficient water at Lakoja, the largest power craft and their barges sail up the river as fast as possible. Towards the end of the short season, the large craft have to come out first because of the fall in the level of the water. The medium-sized craft follow, and the small canoes may continue for some time evacuating small quantities of produce. Drastic changes in water levels are common in other West African rivers and streams. The Senegal River has been characterized as precariously navigable, and only during some months at that. Like the Niger, the Senegal is not only subject to large seasonal changes in water flow, but also contains rocks and rapids. In East Africa, such rivers as the Zambezi are navigable only for relatively short stretches. One reason for the drastic seasonal changes in water levels in African rivers is that tropical Africa is one of the few large regions of the world without a single mountain range to collect snow, whose later melting would supplement rainfall in maintaining the flow of streams and rivers. Rivers in tropical Africa are wholly dependent on rainfall, and that rainfall is itself highly undependable, not only from one season to another, but also from one year to the next. The term navigable can of course mean many things. In some of the rivers of Angola, for example, it means navigable by boats requiring no more than eight feet of water, and in parts of West Africa during the dry season, even the Niger will carry barges weighing no more than eight tons. By contrast, ships weighing 10,000 tons can go hundreds of miles up the Yangtze River in China, and smaller vessels another thousand miles beyond that. Aircraft carriers can go up the Hudson River and dock at a pier in mid-Manhattan. Navigable rivers in Africa seldom mean anything approaching that. Even the Nile was unable to handle the largest vessels in Roman times. Moreover, because so much of tropical Africa consists of high plateaus, almost the entire continent is more than 1,000 feet above sea level, and half the continent is more than 2,500 feet above sea level, African rivers must plunge greater vertical distances to reach the sea, making them less navigable en route. While the Amazon River falls only about 20 feet during its last 500 miles to the sea, the Zaire River drops about a thousand feet in 250 miles as it approaches the sea. As a geographer has put it, the African continent is cursed with a mesa form which converts nearly every river into a plunging torrent. However impenetrable much of the interior of sub-Saharan Africa may have been to large ocean-going ships, the continent's coastal waters have been plied by smaller boats, which could and did go inland as well, being unloaded and carried around waterfalls. Shipments from ocean-going vessels could also be loaded onto smaller craft for transportation into the interior on rivers. Local waterborne traffic between inland locations was likewise possible by carrying boats and their cargoes around rapids and waterfalls. Sometimes these boats and cargoes were carried from one river to another, thereby expanding the reach of commerce. For example, an overland route requiring 25 days of porterage on land connected the Niger and the Senegal rivers in centuries past. Moreover, even rivers beset with cascades and waterfalls may have navigable stretches that add up to considerable distances, hundreds of miles on the Senegal and more than 1,500 on the Zaire even though these are not continuous distances. Thus, the various regions of Africa were not hermetically sealed off from one another or from the outside world, but both the volume and the variety of trade, as well as the distances involved, were nevertheless severely curtailed, in comparison with more geographically fortunate regions of the world, where heavy and bulky cargoes of coal, ores, and grain could be shipped long distances in continuous river and ocean voyages.
A late 20th century comparison of the transportation costs of grain in several Asian and African nations found that these transport costs were a higher proportion of the total price paid for grain by consumers in Africa. Moreover, such statistics do not capture the effect of transport costs on grain that was never shipped in the first place precisely because higher shipping costs would have made it prohibitively expensive. Contemporary transport costs also cannot capture the handicaps created by even higher transport costs in Africa before many of the transportation advances from the rest of the world were introduced in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and before African harbors could be dredged by modern European equipment and Western railroads built. While it is true, as an historian has said, that a considerable portion of West Africa was part of a hydrographic system that was ultimately connected to the Atlantic, the limitations of that system are a part of the story that cannot be omitted without serious distortion. Moreover, the distances between the interior hinterlands and the open seas are greater in Africa than in Europe, for example, while the means of covering those distances are much more limited by geography in Africa. In Europe, no part of the continent outside of Russia is more than 500 miles from the sea, but a substantial part of tropical Africa is more than 500 miles from the sea, and a portion is more than 1,000 miles from the sea. Only Asia has a larger interior area remote from the sea, though Asia has more navigable rivers connecting its interior with the coast. The geographical positions of African rivers must also be taken into account. Although the Niger River originates just 200 miles from the Atlantic Ocean, it circles far inland before eventually turning back toward the sea, and covers 2,600 miles before actually reaching the ocean. In general, the tenuous connection of the African interior with the sea has been one of the major geographical barriers to the economic, cultural, and political development of the continent south of the Sahara. Land transportation in large regions of sub-Saharan Africa has also been made more difficult because of the prevalence of the tsetse fly, which has carried a fatal sickness that has affected animals as well as human beings, and made the use of pack animals and draft animals impracticable in many places. Denied this aid to land transportation, Africans often carried bundles on their heads in colorful caravans that were reflections of the bleak alternatives left to them without the help of either the waterways or the animal power available to other peoples on other continents. Expensive transportation provided by human beings limited what could be carried, how far it could be carried, and how fast. In addition to the physical limitations, there were narrower limits imposed by economics as to what items contained enough value in a relatively small space to repay the costs of this expensive method of transport. The lack of animals' muscle power in tropical Africa has been felt not only in transportation, but also in farming. A dearth of draft animals in farming often meant not only a loss of muscle power, but also a dearth of fertilizer. The latter has been especially important in those parts of the continent where soils have been very much in need of fertilizer because their low nutrient content and proneness to erosion meant that their fertility was easily exhausted by cultivation. Rainfall patterns in parts of Africa, long dry spells followed by torrential downpours, increase erosion since dry, baked soil is more easily washed away. Moreover, these torrential tropical downpours tend to leach the nutrients from the soil in Africa, as in many other tropical regions. Finally, the tropics provide a disease environment in which many more deadly diseases may flourish than in temperate zones, or in mountainous tropical regions that have more temperate climates because of their heights. For example, 90% of all deaths from malaria in the world occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Even a listing of individual geographical disadvantages in Africa may understate the handicap they represent in combination. For example, the problem of poor water transportation, while serious in itself, is still more serious in combination with poor land transportation across much difficult terrain without the aid of pack animals. The highly variable rainfall patterns become more serious in view of where the rain falls. A geographical study of Africa found plenty of water available where it cannot be used, 
and a scarcity where it is most needed. Not all parts of sub-Saharan Africa have suffered all these disabilities simultaneously. However, the fragile fertility in some regions of tropical Africa has meant that a given territory would not permanently feed people at a given location, and this in turn meant that those people had to move on every few years to find new land that would feed them, while the land they left behind recovered its fertility. Therefore, whole societies had to be mobile, foregoing the opportunities to build territorially based communities with permanent structures, such as other Africans built in more geographically favored parts of the continent and which were common in Europe, Asia, and the Western Hemisphere. The provincialism of isolated peoples has not been peculiar to Africa. What has been peculiar to Africa are the geographic barriers to mobility that have pervaded vast areas below the Sahara. Waterways extend the boundaries of cultural interchange, but in much of sub-Saharan Africa they did not extend those cultural boundaries very far. Like other places relatively isolated from broader cultural developments, the Scottish Highlands, parts of the Balkans, or the South Sea Islands, for example, much of sub-Saharan Africa tended to lag behind the technological, organizational, and economic progress in other parts of the world. A lack of literacy throughout most of sub-Saharan Africa further limited both internal development and the stimulus of contacts with distant times and places via the written word. While similar retardation afflicted particular parts of Europe or Asia, or isolated island communities around the world, in Africa such cultural isolation characterized wide areas and many peoples. The degree of these cultural handicaps has varied in different parts of the continent, and has changed over time. Railroads, motor transport, and airplanes have all added to transportation possibilities, and electronic communication media, from cheap radios to television, have penetrated cultural isolation. But all this has happened within a recent, minute fraction of human history, long after great cultural differences had developed among peoples with geographically restricted cultures and between them and others with more ample access to wider cultural worlds. Moreover, even in modern times, the sharp changes in altitude of the African landscape continued to make both roads and railroads difficult to build. The rail line from Djibouti to Addis Ababa, for example, rises more than 2,000 feet in its first 60 miles and more than 4,600 feet in its last 180 miles. Given the multiple and formidable geographical obstacles to its economic and cultural development, Africa's poverty is hardly surprising. This poverty, over much of sub-Saharan Africa, is shown in many ways. Lower incomes per capita are an obvious indicator, though the complexities of international exchange rates make these statistics questionable as measures of relative standards of living. However, when the monetary value of output per capita in Nigeria is less than 2% of that in the United States, and in Tanzania less than 1%, that clearly cannot all be due to exchange rates. A more meaningful picture of differences in living standards is that average life expectancies are typically more than 70 years in Europe, Australia, the United States, Canada, and Japan, while average life expectancies in sub-Saharan Africa tend to be in the 50s or even the 40s. Moreover, even these life expectancies in Africa have been achieved only with the help of medical and public health measures originating elsewhere in the world. Within this general picture of lagging economic development in much of Africa, there have been historic and continuing variations in economic development and political organization among the various regions of the continent. One of the more fortunate regions of sub-Saharan Africa, from various perspectives, has been equatorial West Africa, what is today Nigeria, Ghana, and their neighboring states. This region has some of the continent's more fertile soil, ample rainfall, and the Niger River system. Here some of the larger African kingdoms arose. However, even in this relatively more favored region of Africa, the states and even empires that arose were often small by world standards. The Oyo Empire, in what is today Nigeria, covered an estimated 150,000 square kilometers, which is smaller than the American state of Colorado.
The Songhai Empire, which included the rich river valleys of the central and western Sudan, was about the size of France, which is to say, smaller than Texas. Yet these were huge states by African standards, since most Africans lived in polities only a fraction as large, with national populations no larger than the population of cities or even towns in the rest of the world. In Africa, as in other parts of the world, those peoples who were more fortunate often used their advantages to subjugate others. In West Africa, this subjugation took the form both of conquest and of enslavement of fellow Africans. Across the Sahara, in North Africa, more favorable geographic conditions, including harbors on the Mediterranean, also led to larger and more advanced societies. These, too, used their advantages to subjugate and enslave sub-Saharan Africans. In East Africa, some of the more geographically favored areas included harbors, such as the large natural harbor on the offshore island of Zanzibar, and such mainland ports as Mombasa and Kilwa. All three became major centers for the trading and shipment of slaves, usually captured from less fortunate inland tribes. Here, the enslavers were typically either Arabs or people of mixed Arab and African ancestry and culture, known as Swahilis. The Geography of Eastern and Western Europe Among the geographic advantages of Western Europe lacking in Eastern Europe has been ready access to the oceans of the world. While no point in Western Europe is more than 350 kilometers from the sea, there are parts of Eastern Europe more than 1,000 kilometers from the sea. The warming influence of the Gulf Stream, which moderates the winters in Western Europe, making them much milder than at corresponding latitudes in Asia or North America, is felt less and less to the east, where the continental climate is more bitterly cold in winter and the rivers are frozen for longer periods of time than the rivers of Western Europe. The Baltic Sea is likewise frozen for months at a time. In the Balkans, the mild, subtropical air of the Mediterranean is blocked off by mountain ranges from reaching much of eastern and southeastern Europe, including the hinterlands of the Dalmatian coast. Because of the isolating effect of coastal mountains along the Adriatic shore, winter temperatures inland in Sarajevo may be nearly 50 degrees colder than on the coast, little more than 100 miles away. Many of the rivers of Eastern Europe flow into lakes or inland seas, rather than out into the open waters of the oceans, with their international trade routes, so that the benefits of low-cost access by water to the markets of the world, and the ideas of the world, have historically been far less available in the eastern part of the continent. In the rugged lands of the Balkans, largely lacking navigable rivers and cut off from access to the coast by mountains that come down close to the shore, it has been estimated that in Ottoman times the cost of shipping wheat overland just 100 kilometers exceeded the value of the wheat itself. The painful economic implications of such high transport costs extended well beyond wheat to commerce and industry in general, and also helped explain the cultural insularity which long plagued the region. While Western European nations became the center of trade networks that reached all parts of the world, much of Eastern Europe, and especially the Balkans, remained regions of self-sufficiency, which is to say, isolation, backwardness, and poverty. What foreign trade they had was based on supplying raw materials such as wool, grain, and lumber to Western European nations from whom they bought manufactured goods. Climate and soil are also less favorable in the Balkans, which lacks the more consistent rainfall and more fertile soils of northwestern Europe. The fact that land capable of supporting human life often occurs in isolated patches in mountain valleys has meant that Balkan settlements have often developed in isolation from one another, as well as from the outside world. For Russia, the colder winter climate of Eastern Europe, compared to Western Europe, means that, although the country has an abundance of rivers, those rivers are not abundantly available for use the year round, nor are the northern seaports, which are likewise frozen a substantial part of the year. Russia's warmer southern ports on the Black Sea have had to connect to the outside world through the narrow straits of the Bosporus and the Dardanelles, 
controlled by the Turks and by the Byzantines before them. Only after an 1829 treaty were Russian ships allowed through these straits, thus making large-scale grain shipments from Russia economically feasible. The difference that this made is indicated by the fact that Russian grain could then undersell Croatian grain on the Dalmatian coast, since the Russian grain was shipped at low cost by water and the Croatian grain by land, even though the latter was shipped for shorter distances. While many of the Slavic lands lack the natural resource abundance of Western Europe, Russia's rich deposits of coal, oil, and other resources make it one of the most fortunate countries of the world in that regard. However, only relatively recently in its history have Russia's human resources allowed it to realize much of the potential of its natural resources, for, as late as the end of the 19th century, the vast majority of Russians were still illiterate. As in other regions of the world, physical resources alone have meant little when the complementary human capital was missing. The Geography of the Western Hemisphere While, in narrowly physical terms, the lands and waters of the Western Hemisphere were the same for the indigenous peoples as they would later be for the transplanted populations from Europe, the complete absence of horses, oxen, cattle, and sheep in the Western Hemisphere before the arrival of the Europeans was momentous in its implications for food supply in general, agriculture in particular, and above all for the size of the cultural universe available to any given Indian tribe, nation, or civilization. Horses and camels made the Silk Road a highway stretching thousands of miles across the Eurasian landmass to connect China with Europe, but nothing comparable was possible in the Western Hemisphere to connect the Iroquois on the Atlantic seaboard of North America with the Aztecs of Central America. Italians could acquire spaghetti from China, but the Iroquois could acquire nothing from the Aztecs, or even be aware of their existence. Agriculture in the Western Hemisphere was inherently limited to what could be accomplished without animal muscle power, to carry or to pull loads or to plow the land, as well as to supply manure to maintain the fertility of farms. Land transport in general was obviously severely limited in the loads and the distances that were possible without animals. Even the navigable waterways were limited in their capacities to move cargo by the absence of pack animals and draft animals to transport these cargoes when they reached land. Indian canoes plied the inland and coastal waterways of the hemisphere long before the white man arrived, but larger vessels with greater cargo capacity would have exceeded the severe physical and economic limits of a land without the kinds of animals needed to make larger cargoes economically viable. Llamas were available as pack animals in limited regions of South America, and dogs were used by Eskimos and by some North American Plains Indians to pull loads, but these animals did not compare with horses or oxen in what they could transport. As in much of sub-Saharan Africa, not only were loads and distances limited physically in the Western Hemisphere by an absence of the needed animals, the particular kinds of things that would be economically feasible to trade at considerable distances were even more limited economically to those things whose concentrated value could repay high transport costs, often involving human porters. Tons of grain, for example, could be shipped for hundreds of miles in Europe but not in the Western Hemisphere before the Europeans arrived and brought pack animals and draft animals. Even in those regions of the Western Hemisphere that had networks of waterways comparable to those in Western Europe, limitations on land transport limited cargoes transported by water. Moreover, limitations on the scope and range of trade were also limitations on the scope and range of cultural interchanges. Specific geographic barriers the Amazon jungle, the Rocky Mountains, or the vast desert in what is today the southwestern United States, were of course major barriers to large-scale cultural interactions in pre-Columbian times, but the absence of animals for transport was a more general barrier to long-range cultural interactions throughout the Americas. While these barriers were not as severe as the geographic barriers in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, they were more formidable than those in much of Europe and Asia. 
The absence of herd animals, like sheep and cattle, as well as the absence of load-bearing or load-pulling animals, like horses and oxen, had another consequence. An absence of the many diseases carried by such animals and often acquired by human beings living in close proximity with these animals. While, in one sense, the absence of such diseases was of course a benefit, their absence also meant an absence of biological resistance to many potentially devastating diseases such as smallpox. So long as such diseases did not exist in the Western Hemisphere, the Indians' lack of biological resistance to them was of no consequence. But, once people from Europe began arriving with these diseases, the consequences were momentous not only for those indigenous populations stricken and devastated by these diseases at the time, but also for the historic transfer of North and South America from the indigenous peoples to the European invaders. The most invincible of these invaders proved to be not the Europeans themselves, but the invisible carriers of their diseases, whose existence neither they nor the Indians suspected. The fact that the Eurasian landmass stretches predominantly east and west, while the Western Hemisphere landmasses stretch predominantly north and south, means that advances in agriculture and animal husbandry could spread more readily over far more vast distances in the Old World than in the New. Plants and animals are more similar in the same latitudes, while more drastic climate changes accompany north-south movement. Thus, rice cultivation could spread across Asia to Europe and ultimately to North America, but bananas could not spread from Central America to Canada, nor could many of the animals adapted to the tropics survive in the colder climates to the north or south, so that knowledge of how to hunt or domesticate these animals was similarly restricted in how far it would be applicable, even if such knowledge could be transmitted over long distances. Moreover, the northern temperate zone and the southern temperate zone of the western hemisphere were too far apart to make any sharing of knowledge between them feasible in pre-Columbian times. In short, climate, like other aspects of geography, limited the size of the cultural universes of the indigenous peoples of the western hemisphere. The geographical environment of the western hemisphere itself changed with the European conquest. Vast herds of new animals were transplanted from Europe, along with the invisible transplanting of a whole new disease environment and a whole new technology from Europe. These transplantations changed the lives of the indigenous peoples, as well as allowing the European settlers to bring much of their cultural world to the Americas. Mounted Indian warriors with herds of cattle became a traditional way of life on the western plains of the United States, for example, while the gauchos who herded cattle for Spanish landowners on the Argentina Pampas were often part or full-blooded Indians as well. Such physical features of the Western Hemisphere as natural harbors and rivers reaching deep inland from the sea now became far more important economically after the arrival of white invaders and settlers in ships developed in Europe, but better adapted to exploit New World conditions than were the canoes of the Indians. Those parts of the Western Hemisphere most highly developed by the Europeans were not the same as those that had been most highly developed by the indigenous peoples. Whereas the most advanced Indian civilizations developed in Central America and in the Andes Mountains, the most advanced regions developed by Europeans were those regions whose geography was most like that of Western Europe, places with natural harbors and broad coastal plains crisscrossed by rivers deep enough to carry large ships, and, eventually, places with the mineral deposits needed to build an industrial society. Only in the narrowest physical sense was the geographic setting of the Western Hemisphere the same for the indigenous peoples and for the Europeans. The flora, the fauna, and the disease environments were changed radically and the natural features of the land and the waters acquired a much wider range of possibilities as a result of this, as well as because of the new technology brought from Europe. Moreover, the technology that the Europeans brought to the Western Hemisphere was not simply the technology of Europe. Because of the geography of the Eurasian landmass, Europeans were able to bring to bear in the Western Hemisphere 
the cultural features of lands extending far beyond Europe, but incorporated into their civilization. Europeans were able to cross the Atlantic Ocean in the first place because they could steer with rudders invented in China, calculate their position on the open sea through trigonometry invented in Egypt using numbers created in India. The knowledge they had accumulated from around the world was preserved in letters invented by the Romans and written on paper invented in China. The military power they brought with them increasingly depended on weapons using gunpowder, also invented in Asia. The cultural confrontation in the Western Hemisphere was, in effect, a one-sided struggle between cultures acquired from vast regions of the earth against cultures from much more narrowly circumscribed regions of the New World. Never have the advantages of a wider cultural universe been more dramatically or more devastatingly demonstrated than in the conquests that followed.